Okay, so to simplify this, I'm going to just basically make a guess. So notice that we have a function and a second derivative, and then a second derivative and a function. Now, this almost looks like the chain rule, but it's not. I mean, first, first of all, the negative sign, like, that, that violates chain ruleality. Um, but the other, the, the, the thing that we can guess, though, is what if maybe if we just think of this as the derivative of some something in terms of only first derivatives. And by that I mean, if this integrand here is actually just the d dx of something only involving psi and d psi dx, we can simplify that. And here is my guess. Let's instead try to take the derivative of psi star d psi dx and we'll keep that minus d psi star dx times psi. So we're, we're just, again, this is just a guess. We want to see whether we can get anywhere with this. Um, obviously, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't know where it went. Um, but, but again, this is one of those uh, situations where kind of having seen a, a whole bunch of different types of patterns will help you recognize where to go if you see something crazy, crazy looking like that. So all I'm going to do now is just, we're just going to employ the chain rule a whole bunch of times. We're going to take, in this first term, the derivative of x of that times that, plus that times the derivative of that. So and you'll see where this goes here. This is simply, and I'm just going to write all this out. It will be somewhat longer, of course. Okay, I believe that should be correct. We've simply just taken the, the parcel with respect of everything using the chain rule. And the nice thing here, we see that two of these terms have two first-order derivatives. And this one is a negative, that one's a positive. So we can simply just cancel this with that, and you see why we did that. So this just becomes psi star second d psi minus second, <laughs> second psi star times psi. And why is that useful? Because this is precisely what, <laughs> whatever the hell the integrand of this is here. Uh, it's this thing matches that thing is the whole point. So um, again, this looks a whole lot better when I can write like eight foot long equations, which is literally what I do in a classroom. Um, but what we can do now is replace this inside the integrand with this. And I will circle that in red. So everything that's in red here will get replaced with that instead. And I will write out the result of this as follows. So remember, the left-hand side is still the expected value of momentum. So I believe that should be correct. Again, the expected value of momentum, we have a constant there, the m's have gone out. We've kept our x there, and that came from originally the expectation value of x that we had der uh, derived, der taken the derivative. But what we now have here, and this is the important part, it's a function times a derivative of a function, dx. <laughs> do you see what to do now? Think of all this crap as g. Think of that x as f. So this looks exactly like, and keeping those constant terms in there, i h bar over 2, times the integral of f dg dx dx. And do you see where that integration by parts comes in? So I encourage you to pause it here and do the integration by parts properly. And I'm going to erase this and I'll just write it all up. So I'll see you guys in a moment. Okay, so integrating this whole thing by parts. As a reminder, and I'll just write explicitly what this equals here, it equals i h bar over 2 times minus integral of df dg 
Oh, jeez. <laughs> DF DX, I've done it again, times G DX, plus that surface term FG at the endpoints, which are negative infinity and infinity. And I should have used curly brackets, whatever. Um, so, integrating that by parts, keeping in mind our function f is just x, we get something that looks like this. And remember that negative sign there, but in flipping the, the uh, derivative, we do introduce a negative sign, so I was careful to keep track of that. So we have minus i h bar over 2 times... Now, notice immediately that the whole purpose of doing that integration by, part, by, by parts is to get rid of that x. So we've just flipped that d dx onto the x, which cancels itself out. So this is just 1. And then our integrand simply becomes this thing, but we have our surface term as well. So that's x times that whole crap. But here's the key here. I, I, I had kind of alluded to this previously, but typically when we're dealing with well-behaved functions, this surface term goes away. And the reason for that is, remember that our thing psi, our, our wave function psi, is directly meant to represent the probability of a particle at any point. And in order to be able to normalize that so that we, we have a finite probability of finding something anywhere, it has to drop to zero quickly enough so that if you evaluate this surface integral at, or if you evaluate this function at those endpoints, not only will psi or, or psi star, but also will the derivative of that function both go to zero. So, well, x in theory becomes infinite, we have two functions that drop to zero faster than x. So that's why this surface term is unimportant. Again, because psi is normalizable, or psi squared, in fact, is normalizable, that outweighs that factor of x there. So in the end, we have this thing. Now, we're not entirely there yet, but we're very close. So let me rewrite that, what, what this ultimately becomes. We have minus i h bar over 2, and our integral becomes psi star psi dt, now x, minus d psi star dx psi dx. So, at, at this point here, <laughs> this looks also quite suggestive. So I'm going to kind of slightly rewrite this again as an L term and an R term. And let's focus on the R term here. So the R term, I'll draw it like this. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to just ignore the constants in front just so we can kind of simplify the inside of the integrand. The R term if we have an integral that says d psi star dx psi dx, and by the way, I will keep track of the negative here. <laughs> what does that look like? We can avoid doing this integral, at least as is, by integrating this by parts as well. So at this point here, when we flip that, we negate the, so the negative sign, so we end up with a plus integral of psi star d psi dx dx now our surface term gets the negative sign again but the surface term is simply just psi star psi from negative infinity to infinity and again as we just argued if psi is normalizable psi squared is well, I mean, if psi squared is normalizable, it has to be zero at those infinity points. So this whole thing, we can rewrite in terms of a psi star and a d psi dx. So let's put everything together, and we're so close to being done here. Let's erase the right-hand side. Okay, so we're at the very last step here. Um, and I, I've just had to pause to kind of consider exactly where these negative signs go, but... 
I am quite confident right now that we have not only not dropped any negatives, which I'm actually super proud of, um, but we've kept track of the proper constants and everything is actually gonna work out here. So, and I'm, I'm just more surprised because this doesn't typically happen without like having to redo everything twice. So, a couple things to note. We have, by intentionally keeping our negative sign for that second part, we're gonna just turn the negative into a positive here. So the factor out front is still going to be minus IH bar over two. The integrand is going to be psi star d psi dt, that's d psi dx, plus the same thing, psi star d psi dx dx. And obviously that integrand is just written twice. So this now becomes minus ih bar over two times two times the integral of psi star d psi dx dx. Now, um, if you've been kind of you know following along, which by the way, great job if you have. Um, but if you've been following along, you'll, you'll look at this and you'll say, hey, integrate by, integrate by parts. <laughs> Don't do it, because this is really the, 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 the end point here. Now, if you were to integrate by parts, you would literally just get back exactly what we had before, so don't. Um, now, the, a couple things to note, obviously the twos cancel. And the other thing I'm gonna do, remember, minus IH bar is the same thing as if you were to, <laughs> what do I wanna say? Um, that's the same thing as h bar over i. So you can confirm that for yourself by multiplying both sides by i. If you multiply the right side by i, it's h bar. Multiply the left side by i, that's h bar. So keeping that in mind, again, this is h bar over i times the integral of psi star d psi dx dx and I'm even going to slightly more suggestively write that integrand as this. Instead of d psi dx, it's d dx of psi. It's precisely the same thing. And finally, I'm going to just throw that constant back in the integral. And this is where we were trying to go all along. The left-hand side still is the expected value of momentum. The right-hand side is an integral of psi star, and I'll be as suggestive as I can here, h bar over i d dx psi dx. Where do we get? Or what did we get? Remember, for any expected value, the operator that tells us that value or, or the function that we put in there is that operator. This thing right here is the function that we need to sandwich between psi star and psi to calculate the expected momentum. <laughs> this is good. We've done it correctly. We have something that's completely unexpected, but this is what we're going to what we're going to use to be able to interpret what each of those terms of the Schrodinger equation now means. Um, I am completely exhausted by this point, and and I, I hope that you are if you've done this well. So I'm not going to bother with the, the, the last part. I was originally going to try to throw in a segment on um, um, probability current. But I think this is more than enough, uh, enough work to kind of show how we can use the Schrodinger equation. And just to be entirely clear, I do want to write up very clearly what the momentum operator is just to sum everything up. <laughs>